Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm your host, Phil Huber, joined today by a John Doyle and Dylan Baker design duo here at Woodsmith Magazine. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about quirky tools and some other things that we have going on in the shop. Special thanks to Shaper Tools, the sponsors of today's episode. They're the makers of the Shaper Origin. It's the handheld CNC router that brings digital precision to the craft of woodworking. With it, you can tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more with speed and precision. You could try it risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. And then I uh, just want to read a couple of comments from some past episodes here. Rick from the last podcast said, Hey, thanks for the shop tour last week to Logan. My wife and I really enjoyed seeing behind the scenes of the Woodsmith set podcast and shops. We appreciate you dropping everything to accommodate us. It was nice to meet you, John, Becky, Mark, Steve, and Chris. Sorry. We missed you, Phil and hope your vacation. You enjoyed your vacation as much as we did. Um, so there you go. They enjoyed your vacation. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say, we, we really en enjoyed your vacation. Phil. Yeah. Yeah. I you enjoy, always time. I always enjoy it when other people are on vacation. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so last week we had John Henry who was here, uh, with Logan doing some videos for Panto router and Panto router is an unusual tool and it got me thinking, not that I would necessarily consider Panto router a quirky tool, but I feel like there are, and Dylan, you and I and Rob were talking about this the other day. There's kind of like an accepted set of woodworking tools that people kind of feel as a given. And that may or may not be what's right for people. And so I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about uh, quirky tools. And f to bring you into this, John, is kind of what made me think about it is, you know, I see a lot of folk on on the internets that have gigantic vintage bandsaws, you know, like 24 inch snowflake mm -hmm. Yates American blah blah blahs. And yet, not that long ago, you had purchased a small, what is it? A nine inch Rikon. Yep. Mm -hmm. Little bench top dealy. Little bench top thing. And mm -hmm. it's a sweet little saw. It is. It is. You know, I feel secure in my woodworking masculinity that I can have, <laughs> you know, a nine inch band saw and, and not feel bad about it. I mean, I love that thing. It yeah. does everything I needed to do. So I guess what I liked about it, cause I think you did a, I don't know, what was it? A setup? video with it mm -hmm. an unboxing type an unboxing thing. kind of thing yeah and one thing that i was pretty surprised about that tool was the fact that it had a cast iron table and mm -hmm. solid support underneath and pretty decent horsepower like you're not i mean clearly you're not going to resaw 12 inch boards just because you can't no. but right it will it'll cut wood it's not a yep. it's not a baby saw yeah, it's basically just a scaled down version of our 14 inch bandsaw that we have in the in the shop. So it does it does well for itself. Yeah. What What's the resaw capacity on the Rikon model that you got? I don't know. Is it five or six inches? I don't. Yeah, it's probably probably five inches. I would say for right sure. Yeah. 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 Have you actually uh, you know run it through um, a rigorous testing period? To, you know. Again, more or less, just do a product test on the Rikon. I know you've used it. Quite <laughs> I don't, a bit, yeah, but. I've had it for a couple. Like, uh, it was probably summer of 2020 when I got it. So, okay. Um, I mean, I haven't tried to saw anything that's probably five inches, but I've done you know resawing stuff and cutting curves, cutting circles, all the stuff. So, it's done well. No problems. I love it. What would be what would be entertaining is to see you know how we used to um, or we've done in the past we've kind of constructed these all in one islands. John, you've done one where it's oh you know, yeah a table saw, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I might have a router, a flip top for uh, a router, or excuse me, not a router, uh, a planer. Um, it'd be interesting to do one around a, you know, a, <laughs> a yeah. bandsaw of that size where it has this, yeah. you know, absurdly large in feet, out feet table, this whole island built around this tiny bandsaw. <laughs> I'm but. thinking about converting it into a little bandsaw mill, you know. Yeah, so there you go. We saw branches and small <laughs> yeah. logs, firewood. Hey, everything's fair game, so we yeah. joke, but right. Yep. Well, because we were talking about uh, the other day, uh, you know, just kind of the received wisdom that every woodworker needs to have a cabinet saw, table saw in their workshop. And, you know, something with, you know, 40 plus inches of rip capacity and uh, runs on 220 and, and that kind of thing. And I don't, you know, we've done the episode where I've talked about why I don't have a table saw. But even if you feel like you want a table saw, like, it's maybe not the best one for you is to have a giant one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, we've, again, we've, we've visited this topic a lot. And I, again, it, all being woodworkers, it's there's kind of this disillusionment built around, you know, what a, a grouping of tools looks like to get started. And obviously woodworking not be a being a very uh, um, inexpensive hobby. It's definitely like, you know, it's not up there with, you know, collecting old cars, but certainly you could spend as little or as much on tools as you'd like. And uh, when you're first starting off, it is difficult to navigate and um, kind of figure out, you know, what you need to get started, you know, versus, you know, what are you going to be doing five years down the road from now and what tools are getting, um, getting the most use, you know, how are you maximizing your tools? You know, again, that Phil, we kind of talked about too, a lot of it's probably driven by space initially. Sure. Um, so the, it does kind of lead into this discussion of, you know, does it warrant having new tools? Like, can you outfit yourself with older tools um, to kind of, uh, again, keep the cost down a little bit? But again, it, that's kind of the caveat is, is, you know, you kind of have to do to know. So, um, you know, what, you know, how does one get started? And I think, again, you just kind of have to do a little bit of research, but you, you kind of have to, you know, it's a trial and error thing. So I think to start off, you know, buying used and or older tools is not a bad way to to really get into it um you know you alluded to the fact that you just well your power tool your power saw is your band saw now yeah and that seems to be that seems to be a tool that's common to a lot of uh people in the industry you do see a lot of band saws whether they're 14 inch band saws or they're 18 24 and up just depending on what people you don't have access to, but that seems to be a pretty common power tool that a lot of people have because it's, to me, it's comparable to a router where it has several functions or is able to do or perform several different types of tasks. So, um, I don't really know where I was going with this. I just realized <laughs> I was talking. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So. Blacked out there for a second, <laughs> but it is an interesting topic. It's, it's one that I think it's great to revisit because again, there's a lot out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we, what was the, uh, uh, tool that you had brought up to Rob Phil about it, like a department article? Oh yeah. Cause Rob's working on an article on, um, radial arm saws and, oh, that's right. you know, those were tools that were really common probably in the fifties, sixties and seventies. You know, my dad had one when he got into woodworking and that was the saw that I learned to woodwork on. He had the radial arm saw for a long time before he had a table saw. So I built projects where all the cross cuts, all the miters and dados and even ripping, I set it up to rip, uh, were done on the radial arm saw. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and I've heard from quite a few other people who that's been their story too. And, you know, for a large percentage of people, they don't even know what a radial arm saw is and, or the functions of it have been totally absorbed by having a sliding miter saw, you know, a compound miter Mm -hmm. saw that does a lot of those things. I mean, it won't do ripping or dados, but for all the cross cut work and mitering, you know, people, people do that. Yeah. 
Yeah, my father in law had a razor alarm saw, and it was it was kind of the Swiss Army knife of of tools. Like you said, it could do a lot of functions as far as cross cutting and ripping, and I don't know. I want to introduce the conspiracy theory that the big tool manufacturers killed the rail arm saw so they could sell more tools. Right. So they could sell, like, the table saw and its place and the chop saw and yeah. all the things. So well, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> big, uh, big miter saw. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, we've even had people write in about getting a shopsmith you know, and just being excited. And that, and that's definitely a quirky tool. Like uh, former creative director here, Ted Krylicek had, still has, I believe, uh, the Shopsmith where you can convert it in from a table saw and it has a bandsaw attachment and a drill press and a lathe function and all of those things. So it's a bit of a transformer of a tool, but you know, and it's really easy to dismiss all of those things because it's trying to do a lot. But there are a lot of people who really got into woodworking and enjoy the craft through that tool. Yeah, that that tool is a great. I mean, of course, it, it in retrospect, it is a very large, heavy and cumbersome tool. Like you, you want to put it in a garage or in a basement and not move it, right? But yeah. again, for its time, it was great to have this kind of all-encompassing tool where it, you didn't, um, you didn't have to, you hadn't have to sit around and plan out, you know, what tools you needed to acquire. It's like, okay, this thing has pretty much everything to get started, and everything kind of functions around or orbits around this one tool. Um, so, yeah, you know, looking back, I mean, it's a pretty impressive or ingenious idea. Um, you know, it seemed to be geared towards, you know, more of like a hobby woodworker, but it, it's able to perform a lot of the same functions. Um, again, everything's just kind of, kind of condensed on it, but yeah, uh, but they're, they're, they're definitely coveted. I, I had a friend of mine who found one, this is, it's probably been 10 years now, but he had found one on Craigslist in Des Moines and it was in near mint condition. I'm sure some guy had, you know, grand ideas of, you know, having this wood shop and, or just found his hobbies lying elsewhere, but, you know, he got great use out of it. And again, it, the only other thing he had was, I think he bought a more modern version of like a contractor DeWalt table saw, hmm. but otherwise he used his shopsmith almost exclusively. So, yeah. And I think that, you know, another thing that is common woodworking advice is, you know, where the concept of buy once and cry once, where you get the best possible tool that you can and never have to get rid of it or whatever, you know, or it's always, you know, chasing after the high quality something or other. And, and I don't know that I would, I agree with it on one hand, and I think there's enough room there to poke at that idea where you know, for example, with the shopsmith that it has some limitations in some of its functions, but, you know, like Ted Krylicek, who I alluded to earlier, he has one, but he never got rid of it, even though he's added a bunch of other tools since then, you know, where he just, he uses it essentially as his lathe now with some other functions, like as a disc sander or uh drill press when he needs to press it into service for that. But, you know, so he's never really outgrown that tool, even though he's replaced some of those functions with dedicated tools. And in the same way that you were talking about earlier, Dylan, about, you know, buying a used something or other or a small table saw or whatever, and getting into the craft, knowing what you want to do, and then graduating or moving that tool along to somebody else. You know, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with, I mean, you don't want to buy poorly made tools, but taking an economical entry path into woodworking is definitely something that we need to look at. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely a good way to just familiarize yourself with the tool and just kind of know the limitations of perhaps the tool and, or, and, or maybe yourself and just knowing through doing um, or working with that specific tool. Again, it's just a lot more cost effective way. I mean, one of the first tools I ever bought outside of uh, school was a uh, Rockwell uh, contractor saw. 
and uh, I was delighted to have it. And, you know, but, you know, within a good six months, I realized that it just wasn't going to function for what I was doing uh, in the long term. You know, on smaller projects and stuff, it worked fine. I also had a really small uh, six inch um, granite top. Uh, um, oh, who was the company? That Steel City. Yeah. Steel City mm-hmm. kind of had marketed that granite top. They did a table saw. I think they did a, I had the joiner. Mm-hmm. Um, and those were the, the first two tools that I had. And um, again, there was nothing really wrong with those. It's just, again, they were entry level tools that I could afford at the time. And, um, you know, you just, you get to learn the, learn, you get to learn the tool and know its function and know, again, the limitations or capabilities that it has and, you know, help you kind of dictate what you want to do in the future. Um, Because what starts off as a hobby sometimes, you know, materializes into something else. So, (laughs) or not. (laughs) Yeah. Because another tool that I had uh, thought of that I've seen several people online, and it makes a little connection to my own family history a little, is people using old type cutting saws. Oh, yeah. As small cross cut machines for their shop. So it looks like a kind of like a baby cabinet saw. If you haven't seen one, Hammond makes one. There were several others. And originally what it was for was cutting lead type for the printing industry that you would uh, use it for that. So it has really fine adjustments for cutting parts, pieces to length, especially small pieces. There's usually a built in hold down for the work piece. So there's a lot of precision and safety kind of built into these things. The blades are usually smaller, so it's not, you know, you're not breaking down planks. It's for cross cutting and trimming very parts to a particular size. And I thought it was just kind of ideal for something like that, where you found somebody found uh, a use in another industry for in woodworking for a specific function. Yeah. Tools like that too. It almost kind of fits in the category of how we even tend to retrofit existing tools to accommodate, you know, something that's larger. So, so working on, if you're working on a smaller scale, you know, John, I think you more recently did like a, uh, or again, I'm, I'm mixing up all the things that we do on a regular basis, but, um, (laughs) in terms of like cutting small parts, which Phil's kind of talking about here, you know, type was Mm -hmm. very small, um, but creating like small part sleds for a larger tool that's typically associated with, you know, ripping long boards or cross cutting, you know, eight quarter Mm -hmm. material, but again, scaling things back. So you have, you know, a smaller sled, but you also have a setup fence. So if you're doing multiples of one thing or need a specific size, um, you know, you have a zero clearance insert that you can remove, whether you're doing again, 45s or just a 90 degree cut. Um, so again, finding some of the, finding use for some of those, uh, older tools, whether they're woodworking specific or they were, um, developed for a completely different industry is kind of just another, uh, way of just kind of maximizing or reintroducing, you know, old equipment, um, which is, I mean, it's totally valid. And, and it kind of just goes along with, you know, woodworkers in general. I mean, I feel like they're kind of frugal, resilient people always looking ways to, you know, kind of re-engineer or engineer things to just make them work for themselves. And so, um, it is kind of one of the, uh, interesting parts of woodworking. Oh yeah. I think that's, you know, personally, I feel like there's a level of tinkering that is definitely fun in trying to figure out how to do something or, you know, to make the most of either your material or the tools that you have. And another tool that I was thinking about was, is a drill press. And I would put personally, I would say that a drill press is in the top three tools or machines, stationary machines for a shop. And uh, I have a floor model one, but I started working with uh, a bench top one that I think was, you know, had a pretty small clearance between the column and the between the column and the quill. But I don't, I don't think little drill presses like that are to be sneezed at either. I think there's a lot of 
functionality that you can get out of a drill press, even if it's a smaller size. Yeah. Yeah, that's another, because weren't drill presses more of a metalworking tool and woodworkers kind of borrowed those as well. And so over the years, we've done a lot of jigs and tables and stuff to make them more woodworking tools. But I think there's a lot of companies that uh, do that now as um, treat them more like woodworking tools out of the box or like uh, different things that you can purchase to make them more woodworking friendly. Yeah. And I think you did a video, John, for making a drill press table for a smaller drill press, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So. That's, that's another one of those tools that has become another kind of uh, in vogue item for people who are woodworkers. You know, you always see the old uh, uh, larger kind of industrial band saws that, you know, uh, people or woodworkers have acquired, but drill presses seem to be another one that, um, people really seek out a lot, um, you know, old floor powermatic models that, right. you know, and I don't know if that's a, if it's just, you know, a matter of repurposing something, you know, something old or, you know, obviously the, the machining on them is a lot different. You know, there's cast tables on them. They're a lot heavier. So they might be a little bit more there, you know, they might be more accurate. I know a lot of people really like the larger tables on some of them. Right. Um, but of course you can retrofit. Um, or build your own tables to go on pre-existing ones to increase the size of them. But um, I don't, yeah, I'm not really sure. Again, everyone's a little different, but I'd be curious to know what it is about. I don't know if it's an availability thing or if it's just, you know, the novelty of having something old in your shop. Um, but again, a lot of the people that I've seen, uh, Gerbil Furniture Co. out of St. Louis, they, they always seem to be coming across these really kind of not quirky, but cool old uh, woodworking machines that look like they were, again industrial models of everything um, right from, and they just bought I, i'd have to look back but i know that they more recently got a radial arm saw that they use and they're a production you know custom production furniture company and so they do find tools like that that they want to use for specific tasks they restore them and set them up to do uh the tasks that they need them to do but um yeah they they work well once they're up and running again it's just like breathing yeah. a little bit of life into them and they become kind of this timeless machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're kind of like old cars that way that they were, they were built in a simpler time and a little bit more rugged. So it's kind of cool to, to find those um, hidden gyms and fix them up and get them running again. And Today's episode is brought to you by Shaper Tools. They're the makers of the Shaper Origin, the handheld CNC router that brings digital precision to the craft of woodworking. You can tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more with speed and precision. You could try it risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. I can see drill presses being popular because, you know, mechanically they're pretty simple tools. You know, a motor, belts, you know, the quill system, that's all real easy to understand. There's not a lot of complexity or, you know, fiddling that you need to do on them other than maybe replacing bearings or something like that. And, you know, the little machines can have, you know, a, a, it's a small footprint because rarely, I mean, even for all the floor machines that we have around here, it's extremely rare for us to drop the table down very far you know, to drill into something. And even in terms of the depth of it, it's, you know, it's throat depth or whatever, you know, a lot of times we're using a sanding drum with it or, you know, drilling shelf pin holes or holes for, uh, European hinges, you know, cup holes, um, even screw holes with like a combination pilot countersink bit or whatever, all of that happens relatively close to edges of pieces. So you don't need a lot of capacity to realize a lot of the benefit of having a drill press. Yeah. I think I'm probably the only person in the shop that has my drill press table set like four feet down from the chuck head. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that the other day and it's like, hmm, it, I yeah, there's a story here and I want to know it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, an in another interesting point. Um, so with these old tools, I know there's the issue of sometimes of, you know, finding old parts, right. That can 
you know, accommodate these older machines, um, which, which some of the brands themselves are, are now defunct. Um, I have a buddy of mine that, you know, kind of ran into that issue recently with a non -woodwork, woodworking uh, related thing, but um, was finding that, you know, the parts you can't find, you might be able to machine yourself and, um, you know, CNC's or glow forges, um, you know, laser cutters and those, those types of, or even a water jet cutting. Yeah. Um, not clearly people don't ha have these machines. Some people may not have access mm -hmm. to them, but there are people that do. And so I think that the availability of some of these parts, if they're, um, in low supply or non-existent that people are finding that as long as they can find the specs or be able to pull the old part out that they can recreate these, yeah. which is you know a, mm -hmm. a great resource to have. Um, Cause otherwise a lot of the stuff I think would just become junk, unfortunately. So yeah. Um, yeah. having access to those resources is invaluable again for some of those older mm -hmm. machines and there are people doing it, so. Yeah, between the internet and the technology, like you said, with uh, CNCs or 3D printing, it's amazing that, I mean, you should, I mean, you should be able to find an old part somewhere or somebody who's recreating it because they've had the same issue or looking for the same thing. It's, it's amazing what you can find out there if you do a little searching. Personally, as a Gen Xer, it's also a little fun to be kind of a thumb in the eye of, uh, having to buy the newest, latest, greatest kind of thing too, of being mm -hmm. able to take something that is perfectly adequate, especially for a small hobbyist woodworker and being able to bring it back to life. So there's the satisfaction in restoring something, but also, mm -hmm. you know, stepping out of a disposable society that we sometimes f find ourselves in of using what's available to us. Yeah, that yeah. built-in obsolescence of tools. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm with you, Phil. I mean, I've got, you know, up until, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I had a kind of a Misfits chisel set. And I'm, you know, I, I like the look of some modern tools, but I mean, I, as somebody that does woodworking on a regular basis, I just assume have something that, you know, functions. And even if it is slightly lesser quality, if, as long as I know I can keep a sharp edge on something, um, or it's just some minor adjustment. It's one, a good way to learn the tool, learn how to, you know, hone or shape, sharp your tool, sharpen your tool, repair it, fix it, whatever. Um, but uh, uh, there is a lot of stuff out there that's perfectly adequate. That isn't astronomical in pricing. And, um, again, I short of someone that just has everything very, you know, neat matching newest of the new, I mean, <laughs> You'll, you'll you'll come to find out if the tool performs just as well. It just makes absolutely no difference. Right. And yeah. So, and I think that's where kind of quirky tools come into place too. It's like, how can I um, engineer something or uh, you know use something for it's not its intended purpose and make it work? Um, there's a lot of joy and satisfaction in that as well. Yeah. Well, and I you know buying tools shouldn't be on the same level as getting a tattoo. These are not permanent. You know, we want tools that last a long time, but if ultimately that tool does not match what you need, you know, move it along. It's, you know, there's chances are there's somebody out there who could use it, or maybe there's somebody getting started in the craft that could use it. And you can provide both that tool and another person a connection that, you know, makes it worthwhile. You know, are you going to make your money on it? Maybe, maybe not. But I don't know that that's the point really is, you know, that's just a way for us to pass on uh, our enjoyment of woodworking and the skillful use of tools is, you know, connecting it with other people who are going to use it. Indoctrinating the next generation. Right, right. That's another way to look at it too. <laughs> I, I guess, it, you know, like we for a while we had a box of old wood hand planes around here and it was a bunch of rabbit planes and hollows and rounds. And it was just kind of a mishmash of whatever. And most of the irons on them were shot altogether, rusted beyond belief. But what I thought was kind of cool is on a lot of them, whoever had owned them from whenever that tool was made had stamped initials or wrote their name on it or whatever. And to just see that, connection of like oh yeah you know this guy bought it and probably used it a lot and then 
you know, it got moved on to one of his employees or to a family member or whatever. And now it's my, in my hands and eventually it might be in somebody else's. It's like the partner tattoos, you know, they're just, the names keep getting crossed off down the <laughs> arm. But the <laughs> I, I have, I have a plane that's like that. There's three different names stamped on it. And the other ones are either mm-hmm. uh, etched over or crossed over in pencil. Yeah. And a lot of these came from my grandfather, who was also, you know, somebody who, never bought anything new and was always, you know, scrapping together things and, you know, engineering his own stuff. So, but it's, yeah, it's that it tells a story. Mm -hmm. So you guys think of any other quirky tools that you've run across or seen other people using where it falls outside the lines a little bit. I can't believe we're like 30 minutes into a conversation on quirky t- tools and we've have not talked about a cork sanding block yet. I mean, that's like the number one quirky tool right there. <laughs> it's hundred percent quirky cork. Well, Phil, you and I talked about mm-hmm. a couple the other day. I mean, they are woodworking tools. Um, I don't know. You'll have to uh, refresh my memory, but we were talking about uh, the Ishitani, um, a Japanese woodworker. Oh yeah. Yeah. He has, is some of those either they're you know Japanese made or like Eastern European machines. Um, he has one that is uh, one of them's a planer, right? Um, and then the other one was kind of this open arbor table saw that he used for cutting tenons. Yeah, uh, just the uh, the the one that you were talking about the surfacer. It's kind of like a thickness planer. They call them a super surfacer. I yeah. think is the, I don't know if that's the brand name or just the category where it's essentially, it's like a hand plane with a power feed on it. And, you know, you pass a board through it like you would with a thickness planer, but it's got a straight hand plane like blade. And as you pass the piece through these wispy, you know, gossamer shavings come off of it. You're, you're not grinding away a lot of material, but you are putting essentially that final surface on. And it's just kind of a, you know, they're common in Japan, and I don't know that I've seen them anywhere else other than somebody who got the tool in Japan and brought it over here. Right. You know, there's no, you know, DeWalt doesn't have one or whatever. Um, I thought, so I thought those were kind of cool. You know, like, what are the needs of Japanese woodworkers that that tool exists there? And um, the other one is something that I've always thought as a, as a cool tool uh, and friend of the show, Ben Strano felt the same way over at fine woodworking. And he's been on the lookout for the Inca table saw. It's, it's about bench top table saw size. Um, kind of like a contractor saw, but these have, uh, it's a tilting table. So the blade doesn't tilt the table tilts when you want to do uh, bevel cuts, but because of that, that means the arbor is fixed, but on the outside of the arbor shaft is a chuck and an XY table for mortising. So you have this combination tool in a really small package. Like it's, it's smaller than your, you know, old Delta contractor saw, but you know, you could set it up for, you know, doing that. And I've seen some other tools, I think primarily European table saws where it was just kind of this uh, combination tool, you know, without being too many combinations. It was a table saw that on the end of the arbor had the mortising attachment with a little XY table. I think if you look in some of James Krenoff's books too, he's got a, a table saw that does that same kind of thing. And I, it just seems like a natural extension of you know, what you're using the table saw for already is just to spin a cutter and then, you know, a small X, Y table that slides around on levers is kind of a fun, fun way to get extra use out of a, what can sometimes be a space hog of a tool. Speaking of bench top saws, can't remember what it was called, but we had it come through in the last year or two. It was the it's like a sliding table with a stationary saw blade. I want to say like the Kerf Master or Kerf Maker. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, Bridge uh, the Bridge City. I think it's the Joint Maker Pro or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Yes, yeah. that sounds right. So that that was kind of a funky yeah. little tool. I thought that was kind of cool. I remember when uh, John Economaki of Bridge City came out with that tool, and he brought it to the Woodsmith offices at one point and demonstrated its use. It's uses a Japanese saw blade instead of a table saw blade and has a sliding table that you just pass across the blade to make, make a cut in it, you know, for small pieces and things that you're working on. I think it's super cool. Is the blade on it tilted as well, or is it parallel to the table? Uh, it's tilted a little bit and you can actually adjust the degree of tilt on it. And I don't remember if it's, you slide the table forward and then raise the blade like a notch and then make another pass. Or if there was a mechanism in there that, you know, after every pass, it clicked the blade up a little bit higher. I think you just cranked it up just a little in between passes in order to, you know, make a cut through thicker pieces, you know, and he was using it on, you know, obviously you're thinking of like, you know, Kumiko panels or model making or, you know, very small decorative elements or moldings and things like that. But he was, he actually cut through some pretty sizable pieces with that. And I was, it was kind of cool. I mean, it's not a, it's not a bargain tool, but it's extremely well made. So it's worth, it's worth it in that sense. Yeah. The, jo you know, joiner planer combos are, are, are you know, I, I don't know if they were ever out of fashion. I just think that some people like them, some people don't, um, but are, you know, they can be a pretty great space saver too, because oftentimes, you know, people will position their joiner and then maybe put the bench top planer on the other side of it using, you know, maybe the table of their table saw to be, you know, act as an in feed or out feed table for either one of those tools. Sure. Uh, there's definitely a lot of creative ways to organize your shop, but, um, you know, my brother, splits shop space up in milwaukee with um a buddy of his and they they had just got um they had just got one of those i think it was maybe the the 15 inch which is pretty you know seems like a pretty standard size for a floor model planer but 15 inch joiner is pretty substantial <laughs> yeah that is definitely cool because we have the rikon one in the shop here with that's a 12 inch and it is it's delightful when you want to, you know, straighten the face of a pretty wide board without having to mess with it. So yeah, those are definitely cool. That was another one I think uh, Ted Krylicek had in his home shop. I think it was Robland was the brand where it was a jointer planer combo, but then on the back side had a mortising table. So it just, Oh, okay. Yeah. Didn't uh, Kent Welsh have one of those? Yes. Well, his is a uh, his is the one where it's the table saw, jointer, planer, shaper, mortiser. Okay. I think the like five in one combo. And those are big, big tools. Yeah, it's a, yeah. It takes up some real estate on your floor. Yeah. But again, as a one man shop, you know, like that is the centerpiece of his garage shop and he can do whatever, basically whatever he wants with it, you know, and I think the only other tools, big tools that he owns would be like a drill press and a bandsaw, you know, and if it's just you, then, it, you know, you work your way around it and you adapt to it. So speaking of adaptation. Uh, Dylan, you got a kind of a fun little side hustle project going on in the shop. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I guess you're speaking of the, the, the dining, dining table. table. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have a dining table in the shop right now that I just acquired yesterday, um, from a client that was a piece they had bought, I think maybe 30, 40 years ago. So it's definitely an heirloom at this point and something that they've gotten a lot of good use out of, um, it kind of looks like a frame and panel construction with what would be like a um, not tongue and groove, a shiplap basically panel in the middle. But what, what it really is, is just a series of very thin, almost like three eighths inch panels that are glued and pin nailed to the top to kind of create that effect. But uh, the client was out of town and had some water leak down through the ceiling and onto the tabletop and it had 
worked its way through the grooves in the top and then got underneath where the raw edge is and where the water absorbed and then it ended up cupping the boards. Um, so I am in the process. I had just removed that plank and I'm kind of deciding what I want to do. Uh, you know, initially, if I if it was relatively unharmed, I was going to try to uh, kind of coherce it back by straightening the board by either re-wetting it or heating it up and um, trying to re-flatten it. But I think at this point, uh, my plan of attack is to uh, replace that board with a new one, um, get uh, try and match the stain as close as possible, and then I'll probably lightly sand the entire table just to knock back the finish. Sure. And then tint, tint the lacquer, which is kind of a common practice for me with dining tables these days. So. <laughs> It, it's always now when you Go say ahead. as you say when you say this like slat is cupping it's like a five inch uh wide slat that's like you said three eighths inch thick but it looks like it's starting to curl up into like one of those cinnamon <laughs> sticks right. the, you know those dry <laughs> yeah that's cupping, like yeah. that's how much it's, it's cupping not so curling you got it's your almost cut out for you there yeah yeah it's swirling yeah it, so. it's noticeable or was but but the other thing that's interesting too is like to see in the construction of that, like they put the glue under there, but very few spots was it contacting right. the glue. It wasn't like they kind of just swirled glue around and then stuck it and pinned yeah. it down there. And had it not gotten wet, I'm sure it would have been fine. But then you see that and it's like, oh, it wasn't really glued down that much. So Yeah, I mean, it was clearly like a very manufactured. I think they said they had got it in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um the Chicago market at one point they had hired an interior decorator and um, I was assured that it was the most expensive piece of furniture they had ever purchased short of their <laughs> buffet that sits right next to the table. So, um, yeah. but yeah, you, you make an interesting point, John, you never, especially with dining tables, you just never know what you're going to get into. And I don't ever really like doing, I don't like refinishing like aprons and legs because they're, they're ornate and stripping stain off. It can just be a really like caustic and nasty thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so I usually only volunteer my time to redo tops. Um, but yeah, just there's so many different construction methods out there with these dining tables, regardless of how much you spend on them. You know, you get some that are just, you know, plywood with very, very thin veneer. Right. Um, you know, best case scenario is that they're hardwood and you can take them back to bare wood. Um, this one happens to be, hardwood <laughs> used as basically like laminate onto like a substrate the way you lay tile in a bathroom. So, um, yeah, you never really know what you're going to get, get into. Yeah. I guess I was really surprised at the construction method too. Cause when I first saw the piece that had cupped, I thought that it was, a I don't know that it had some kind of a plywood or MDF core on it. But then when you got it up and flipped it over and it, Oh, it is a solid plank. And it's put down almost like hardwood flooring in a kitchen in the sense that it's there is a base layer and glue and nails and it's down on that. And it's just as something totally funky for what you would normally think of as a solid wood dining table top. Yeah. It's just like installation work, basically. Yeah. <laughs> But everything else is pretty robust and sound on the table. Yeah, it's got so. a cool look to it. I do like it. Yeah. It is interesting, though, that they would have chosen, a, you know, if they were going to go the hardwood route to put something that thin down. Right. And add glue. I mean, I, it, pin nailing it probably would have been sufficient. But Yeah. Interesting to know what kind of glue that is. It's got kind of a red hue now, but. Yeah, it's probably a yellow glue of some sort. Yeah. John, you working on anything? Just going nuts, trying to get all the TV stuff yep. done by the end of the month. So that's we're uh, working on a two-part episode of the Green and Green bookcase. And it's a big project, but surprisingly has been going quite well. Yeah. Surprisingly well. It was fun. So My part of it was putting the doors together on camera. And between you and I, I was concerned about how they would fit the openings and whether they were flat or square or whatever. And 
I think the quote of the day was when you were very surprised and hanging the first door that it came about to the middle of the project and was flat and mm -hmm. fit right in. So it was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. We've kind of been looking over our <laughs> shoulder and waiting for the anvil to drop on us on this project, but yeah, going great so far. We're down the home stretch. So. Yeah. 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 Chris has got the drawers to work on yet and we're doing, we're, we're clipping along and to compare it to the one that we did in the magazine, which we have here in the, on the studio set is kind of cool. It's, it's a very distinctive project and even in its unfinished state has a really cool look to it. Yeah, it does. It's looking yeah, pretty sharp. Absolutely. So I'll post on the show notes page. I'm working on a grill cart that I think I've mentioned before and I got, coat of finish on the door. I had to make a coopered door for it. I didn't have to. I just chose to make a coopered door on it to match the the shape of it. So I'll be doing a video on that coming up and I'll put a put a photo with it so you can see what it looks like. So yeah. Otherwise cool. I think that wraps it up for another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks, or even quirky tool suggestions, I'd love to hear about it. You can send me an email, woodsmith at woodsmith.com, or leave a comment on our YouTube channel where you can see our lovely faces as we embark on this fun discussion from today's show. Special thanks to Shaper Tools, uh, the makers of the Shaper Origin, the handheld CNC router that you can do all kinds of stuff with it. It's pretty cool. You could try it risk-free in your shop. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Bye.